When Charles Darwin published On the Origin of Species in 1859, it took the scientific community by storm. While Darwin's ideas had detractors, the work quickly became the lens through which all other biological works were viewed. His theory has infiltrated nearly every aspect of society. If we read a bit further into Darwin's rather verbose title, we see the proposed method of evolution by means of natural selection. What exactly is natural selection? Most scientists embrace it. Even many who believe that the universe was created by God in a literal week accept this as a real thing. But today, a growing number of evolutionary scientists express doubts about it. Let's find out why on today's episode of Creation Connection. Welcome to Creation Connection, I'm Ivana. Before we begin, here's your friendly reminder to like, subscribe, and ring the bell. Okay, let's go. In Darwin's day, most scientists held to a common belief that creatures were created by God, and that the incredible variety of species and the adaptations among them were evidence of a designer. Then, in 1831, Darwin accepted the position of ship's naturalist on the HMS Beagle and began a difficult five-year expedition that would change the course of his life and the course of modern scientific thought. He was a geologist by trade, and as a gift, the captain of the ship gave him a copy of the book Principles of Geology. For me? Its pages were rife with uniformitarian ideas. Darwin utilized one of these principles, the notion of long ages, to explain the geologic formations he saw on his journey. <coughs> then, during a five-week excursion among the islands of the Galapagos Archipelago, he applied this framework to animals. He considered that mm. although the creatures of the archipelago seem related mm. to their mainland counterparts, the unique environment of the islands caused mm. animal traits to adjust. Nice hat. Thus, the modern idea of natural selection was put into words and became the very foundation of evolutionary theory. As one textbook puts it, Darwin not only demonstrated that evolution has occurred, but also proposed its principal mechanism, natural selection. Dr. Jerry Coyne, a prominent evolutionary biologist and author of Why Evolution is True, says in his book, Everywhere we look in nature, we see animals that seem beautifully designed to fit their environment. It's no surprise that early naturalists believed that animals were the product of celestial design created by God to do their jobs. Darwin dispelled this notion in The Origin. In a single chapter, he completely replaced centuries of certainty about divine design with the notion of a mindless, materialistic process, natural selection, that could accomplish the same result. So then the designer was removed from the process and evolution through natural selection could occur without any sort of outside influence. That's it. We're finished. Case closed, right? I don't think so. Even some evolutionists argue against the idea of natural selection. They note that, in essence, one mystical agent was swapped with another. God has been replaced by natural selection. Since neither explanation provides a stepwise mechanism for evolution to occur, these particular critics deem both ideas equally unscientific. Natural selection is, at its core, intended to describe how organisms' traits seem to fit so exceptionally well into their environments. Yet, in doing so, evolutionists have credited nature with both creativity and the ability to make choices, which in turn makes nature more like a stand-in deity than any sort of scientific process. Evolutionary scientist Stephen L. Talbot admits that 
Evolutionary biologists routinely speak of natural selection as if it were an agent. And natural selection becomes rather like an occult power of the pre-scientific age. In the book, Biological Emergences, Evolution by Natural Experiment, author Robert Reed confesses, indeed, the language of neo-Darwinism is so careless that the words divine plan can be substituted for selection pressure in any popular work in the biological literature without the slightest disruption in the logical flow of argument. Neo-Darwinism, in a general sense, is just the modern version of Darwin's theory that incorporates a bit of genetics. But if selection pressure and divine plan can be exchanged so effortlessly, then the idea of natural selection comes out as less scientific than most of us were led to believe. Even Darwin himself had some issues with this particular line of thinking. The term natural selection is in some respects a bad one, as it seems to imply conscious choice. But this will be disregarded after a little familiarity. I have also often personified the word nature, for I have found it difficult to avoid this ambiguity. If natural selection gives nature the ability to create complex designs and choose who will live and die, then Darwin wasn't being honest. He tried to remove God from the equation. Instead, Darwin simply replaced a very real and powerful god with an imaginary powerless god, nature. While words like selection pressure sound impressive and scientific, the effects of so-called natural selection can't be measured. On top of that, experts even have trouble defining the term itself. Ford Doolittle, an evolutionary and molecular biologist, conceded, Practicing biologists may be surprised that there is still debate about what kind of force, principle, or process natural selection actually is, on what sort of entities it might act, and the meaning of fitness. We readily invoke, but often cannot easily explicate these concepts. Natural selection seems to be nothing more than a metaphor an attempt to explain away design. Man has ascribed intelligence, creativity, and credit to nature that nature does not deserve. If it cannot be measured, and experts can't agree on what it means, then why is it still the foundation for biological evolution? How can we describe how creatures adapt to their environments without calling on nature as an agent of change? Here at ICR, our scientists have worked hard to develop a model that does just that. It's called Continuous Environmental Tracking. Continuous Environmental Tracking is a hypothesis that incorporates human engineering analogs and assumes that creatures have been designed with intelligently engineered systems, which includes sensors or detectors, logic mechanisms, and output responses. And so when you put all these together, we find that a creature can move in and fill an environment as it detects and also responds to environmental conditions using these detectors or receptors. And so this is what God has done in what we call continuous environmental tracking using these exquisitely designed systems, which are the opposite of time and chance and natural processes that evolutionists talk about. And it's important to note that every living creature that we know of has these logic mechanisms, which helps them to monitor and respond to changing environmental conditions. It's extremely sophisticated and detailed and points clearly to design. The name is a bit of a mouthful, but it's quite simple, really. From here on out, I'll refer to it as CET. It begins with the idea that God placed within creatures the ability to sense changes in their environments and to adapt in response. This equips them to fulfill their purpose to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Imagine you're driving around one day and your headlights are switched to the automatic setting. It starts to storm and the sky gets really dark. Suddenly, your headlights turn on. The sensors in your car recognized that there was less light coming in and relayed that information to a switch that turned on your headlights. That is what your car was designed to do. 
Would you say that the darkness selected your headlights? No. The sensors and headlights were already there, ready to be used when needed. That describes CET in a very simplified nutshell. The same concept is proving true with living creatures. Consider the Mexican tetra, or Mexican blind cavefish. This fascinating little swimmer comes in two major forms. One has eyes, and the other doesn't. Surface-dwelling tetras have eyes that let them see, obviously. However, the blind variety live deep in caves where little to no light is present, and they have no eyes. Since there is no light available for the fish to use to see, having eyes doesn't benefit them. And the blind variety of the Mexican cavefish not only survives, but thrives. Does the environment in which the blind tetra lives cause the fish to lose its eyes? The concept of natural selection would say yes. But really, the dark cave doesn't do anything to the fish. All of the changes occur from sensors and switches within the fish itself. While the idea of evolution by natural selection attributes adaptation to chance environmental conditions like darkness or predators, CET describes how organisms have built-in abilities to track their environment and adapt accordingly. In short, nature cannot select anything. It has no creative agency and is therefore incapable of forming the incredibly diverse creatures we see every day. Instead, we see internal biological machinery that adjusts creatures' traits in response to specifically detected outside conditions. The CET model describes a realistic mechanism instead of a fictional force for changes in creature features. It holds that adaptation primarily occurs not from outside an organism, but from within. Jesus Christ is the creator and designer who endowed living creatures with spectacular abilities to change along with their environments, all to his glory. I think it's important as creation scientists that we directly address natural selection because it's the foundation, the cornerstone of evolutionary naturalism. When you have an atheist and a creationist looking at something as spectacular as a blooming rose, the creationist would say, look what God has done. But the evolutionary naturalist would say, what are you talking about? Look what natural selection has done. And anywhere we look in God's living world, we would give glory to the creator and not the creation, as Paul talks about in Romans chapter 1. So that really is the big difference between natural selection and CET. It all depends on the individual's worldview. Throughout history, people have noticed just how complex the natural world is, including the animals that call it home. According to scripture, we know that God made these creatures during the creation week and gave each one the ability to reproduce after its own kind. The ability that living things have to sense changes around them and adapt to those changes speaks to God's creative design. Romans tells us that his attributes are clearly seen through his handiwork. Our creator is not a God of death and random chance, but one of beauty, design, and creativity in life. Let's give him the glory. Thanks for watching Creation Connection. New episodes come out on Wednesdays. You don't need to go on a years long voyage to find a boatload of resources at icr.org. Make sure to like, subscribe, and share this video. We'll see you here next time on Creation Connection. Whoa, those finches are really cool. And look at that tortoise. Isn't it crazy how nature just made that? Why did nature select for you guys?